Good day, everyone. My name is Emily Mahoko, and I would like to take the opportunity to once again thank you for joining us for our second quarterly feedback sessions. As we begin to reflect on the end of the financial year for Momentum Investments, we want to recognize all of you for your valuable contribution to our business. This is what makes our partnership with you valuable. I would also like to thank our investment colleagues that will be joining us today to take you some of the valuable insights. Because August is Women's Month, we would like to commemorate all our women within MFP. We salute you and all your hard work. On the back of a very successful Houseview Solutions launch of our new Focus Model Portfolio range, we included an industry first for you, MFP. We saw the need for your portfolio managers to keep you updated on the positioning of these capabilities. You can expect the following from our event today. A brief economic overview and general market conditions. Fund positioning and returns from our multi-asset class solutions in the unit trust and model portfolios. And finally, an update on our fixed income fund range. Just a reminder that these capabilities are available at your convenience on the Momentum Wealth platform. And if you use Investor, the collective investment range or unit trust are available there. We will begin with our very own economist, Sanisha Perkasami, who, by the way, is back from maternity leave. Congratulations, Sanisha. Please make use of the chat functionality as we have our specialists on hand to answer any questions you may have. If you attend the full session, we will send you a CPD certificate. Thank you for joining us and enjoy the session. Over to you, Sanisha. Thank you, Emily. It is great to be back. The COVID-19 pandemic plunged the world economy into the worst recession experienced in post-war history as the health shock of the virus and the related government-induced shutdown measures ultimately decimated economic growth last year in 2020. At the surface, however, it appears as though global growth is once again booming. The World Bank predicts a return to global growth of about 5.5% for this year. Now, this would mark the strongest growth rate in economic activity since 1973, and it would be placed as the strongest paced post-recession recovery we've seen in 80 years, as you can see here in the solid red line in chart one. Nevertheless, the strong rebound is unlikely to be felt evenly across the globe. And in our view, economic fortunes are likely to be highly divergent across countries. Less available fiscal and monetary policy space as well as new and more severe virus strains in lower vaccinated countries, will likely keep the relative pace of economic recovery in emerging markets on the back foot. In fact, excess growth in emerging markets above that of developed nations is set to fall to its weakest level since the beginning of the century. This level of growth outperformance is significantly weaker than the average of around 3.5% that we've experienced throughout this period since 2000, as you can see over here in chart two. This outcome contrasts quite starkly with the recovery observed following the global financial crisis, where sizable stimulus efforts made by Chinese authorities lifted emerging market growth, and that effectively propelled global growth. This time around, however, we've seen that swift and sizable monetary and fiscal policy actions have paved the road for a sharper rebound in economic activity in many major advanced economies. Generous economic support packages, as well as a relaxation in measures to control the spread of the virus, have allowed a surge in pent-up demand. This has helped to boost growth outcomes in these advanced economies. Now, chart three over here suggests that a number of advanced economies drew down their fiscal buffers and mobilized significant amounts of public sector funds in order to combat the negative health and economic impacts of the crisis. In comparison, emerging markets on average had very limited policy space entering the crisis and as such had less funds to actually deploy to support an economic recovery. Highly unequal vaccine coverage globally has further driven a wedge between expected growth outcomes in advanced economies and their developing counterparts. In its latest World Economic Outlook Update publication for July, the International Monetary Fund, or the IMF, 
show that close on 40% of the population in advanced economies have already been fully vaccinated. But the share drops by more than half when looking at the data for emerging economies, as you can see over here in chart four. The share is dismally low when looking at what the International Monetary Fund classifies as low income countries. Now, these are countries that account for a fifth of the world's population, but they only make up 4% of global economic output. Despite stronger external demand coming through from developed nations, the expected growth rebound in low income developing countries will be weighed down by a slow rollout of the vaccine and reasonably bleak labor market prospects in an environment where exposure to poverty has increased and where inequality has widened. With advanced economies recovering to their pre-recession levels a lot quicker, the amount of spare capacity in these economies is likely to reduce at a much faster pace. But despite the gap between actual and potential growth narrowing at a quicker rate in advanced economies, the Bank for International Settlements argues that the three factors that are generally associated with persistent inflationary episodes are unlikely to materialize this time around. Firstly, as savings rates come down and bottlenecks alleviate, demand is unlikely to remain sustainably above supply. Secondly, other than in the US where low income job cuts have actually skewed the data, sustained wage increases in excess of productivity are unlikely. Thirdly, longer term inflation expectations remain reasonably well anchored. And then finally, in our opinion, structural drivers that place downward pressure on inflation, things like automation, remain firmly in play. With the focus of key developed market central banks shifting from a fixed target level of inflation to average inflation targeting, it is likely in our view that above target inflation could be tolerated for longer periods of time, leaving monetary policy looser for longer than what we had seen under the previous monetary policy regime. In previous communications, the US Federal Reserve had clearly stated its intention to reduce bond purchases before it actually commences with raising the short-term interest rate. Now, unlike the taper tantrum that shook global markets in 2013 and resulted in capital flight from the more vulnerable emerging markets, this time around we see two key differences. Firstly, Current account deficits for the so-called fragile five countries are much narrower on average. Now, these five countries include South Africa, Brazil, India, Indonesia, and Turkey. According to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, these current account deficits have shrunk on average from around 4% as a share of GDP all the way back in 2013 to around three quarters of a percent in 2020, which has significantly reduced gross external financing needs. And secondly, the flow of external funds into the emerging market composite in recent years has been considerably lower than in the years that led up to the taper tantrum in 2013. If less capital has flowed into emerging markets, it essentially suggests that there is less capital to flow back out. As lockdown restrictions eased across the globe, consumer demand has also picked up. Now this, together with bottlenecks in global supply chains, has led to a robust rally in commodity prices. This has benefited South Africa's current account balance, and that really just means that more money has been received from foreign countries than what we have paid out to foreign countries. In our view, having a less vulnerable external position helps us to offset some of the risks that could be associated with the potential capital outflow in the event of premature withdrawal of global liquidity. Firm commodity prices have resulted in the highest terms of trade on record in South Africa, as you can see here in chart seven, particularly with the rise we've observed in gold, coal, and platinum prices earlier in the year. These three commodities constitute quite a large portion of SA's exported commodities, and so therefore they are seen as the key drivers of terms of trade playing out in our economy. The terms of trade measure effectively reflects export prices relative to import prices. Export growth has consistently outpaced the recovery of imports in SA in recent months, and this is expected to drive a record current account surplus position for the second quarter of this year. Now, this will be the highest surplus position that we've seen since the dawn of our democracy. Since the bulk of this improvement is driven in value terms, we are still of the opinion that infrastructure bottlenecks and lagging structural reforms in South Africa 
continued to hinder export prospects in volume terms. South Africa's level of lockdown restrictions had tightened once again on the 28th of June this year to an adjusted alert level four. And this was largely in response to the third wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. The advance of this third wave was fueled by the new Delta variant, and this superseded the severity of the first two waves. We are largely of the opinion that global health inequality delays in the vaccination rollout plan and just general uncertainty around the efficacy and side effects of the vaccines initially have been to blame for the slow rollout of the vaccine. Chart nine over here shows that a calculation by Bloomberg suggests that at the current vaccination pace, it would take more than 13 months for South Africa to reach a vaccination coverage for 75% of the population, which is deemed necessary to achieve herd immunity. Now, this compares with the lesser six months that is required to ensure coverage for 75% of the global population. Nevertheless, we've seen recent studies suggesting that this level of 75% may in fact need to be more than 10% higher to achieve herd immunity in countries where the Delta variant of the virus is more prevalent. This would effectively almost be as high as the percentage needed to reach herd immunity for something like chickenpox. Currently, fewer than 9% of South African adults have been fully vaccinated. Subsequently, more stringent lockdown measures have been triggered in order to contain this third wave. In July, South Africa faced yet another growth setback. This time around, human and economic damage resulted from looting and violence on the pretext of a political grievance, as was stated by President Cyril Ramaphosa. The damage was most severely felt in the country's economic hubs of Gauteng and KwaZulu-Natal, which account for half of economic activity in our country. While in the short term, lost stock and disruptions to production are likely to drive a negative quarterly growth print for the third quarter of this year, the potential for inventory restocking and a rebuild of damaged infrastructure could actually add to growth further out. Although we expect growth to rebound to above 3.5% this year from that 7% contraction that we experienced in 2020, the growth rate in economic activity is likely to slow to around 2% in 2022 and may dip even further in the following year on longer-term structural impediments that we see to growth. Now, indeed, strides have been made in ramping up delivery on structural reform, and these include lifting the cap on the limit for self-generation power, signaling the intention to partly privatize the national carrier, paving the way for private operators to establish commercial container handling operations, as well as taking action against those that have been accountable for rampant corruption. However, the threat of unrest motivated by socioeconomic factors can be directly linked to longer-term damage to the country's growth outcomes. In a July 2021 blog post, the IMF highlighted that demonstrations triggered by a combination of both socioeconomic and political factors have had the biggest impact on GDP historically. The IMF emphasizes that boosting employment and protecting those who have been left behind in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic must remain governmental priorities. Employment data from Statistics South Africa confirms this sentiment by showing that the majority of job losses between the first quarter of 2020 and the first quarter of 2021 have in fact been concentrated in lower skilled areas of the economy as we depict here in chart 11. But in South Africa's case, this discussion has to be held in the context of sustainably financing budget pressures. The World Bank has shown that the country's fiscal position has deteriorated markedly over the past decade, and more so than its peers, as you can see here in chart 12. The composition of spending, which was largely allocated to public sector compensation and interest payments in lieu of capital spending, has also played a role in reducing the effectiveness of government spending on overall growth outcomes. Although buoyant commodity prices have led to an upside surprise in government revenue relative to Treasury's February projections, demands on the fiscus have grown. Part of the revenue overrun will now have to cover the additional costs associated with the finalized public sector wage bill agreement, as well as to fund additional fiscal support measures which were announced in response to the July unrest and further lockdown restrictions which hindered economic activity.
both of these developments have the potential to raise risks further out than just the immediate fiscal year. Firstly, government will inevitably face ongoing discussions for the big basic income grant in the absence of significant job creation. And secondly, the public sector wage bill settlement is a single year agreement. And if wage discussions are not finalized by the end of March next year, that negotiated cash bonus will continue into the next fiscal year, only raising medium term fiscal risks even more. The SA Reserve Bank has also played its pivotal role in supporting economic growth throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. They've done this through keeping interest rates accommodative, as well as by providing regulatory relief to the banking system. Inflationary pressures have remained largely dormant despite global supply chain disruptions that have exerted upward pressure on certain raw material inputs. Services inflation, which accounts for roughly half of the consumer basket, has remained contained at an average of just above 4% for the past 12 months, as you can see over here in chart 13. Now, this has partly been due to excess housing supply that has put downward pressure on rentals, but we've also seen lower inflation in a number of other service categories, including things like education and restaurants. Underlying inflationary pressures have further remained well-behaved in light of subdued demand. And in line with moderating services inflation, average five-year ahead inflation expectations have moderated to close to the target band. The pass-through from the currency into the inflation basket in recent years has moderated significantly on the back of weaker demand. Although the RAND has been the third best performing currency against the US dollar year to date, we still see scope for mild currency depreciation as the US dollar strengthens moderately, as commodity prices soften, and as domestic growth and fiscal concerns weigh heavily on our medium-term economic outlook. Consequently, our inflation forecasts reflect the relatively benign view that the SA Reserve Bank holds on inflation for the foreseeable future. As such, in the absence of any major currency or inflation shock, we don't see any immediate pressure on the SA Reserve Bank to raise interest rates. And therefore, we see risks to the first interest rate hike as being more tilted towards the first quarter of 2022. So to wrap up, Although prospects for the rebound in global growth remain robust, economic fortunes have widened between those countries with higher vaccination rates and generous stimulus efforts, and those facing rising COVID-19 death tolls due to lower vaccination rates and smaller fiscal and monetary policy responses. We expect major developed market central bank rhetoric around average inflation targeting to shape inflation expectations and help to prevent preemptive action from authorities. Domestically, we believe that despite better than expected revenue due to a commodity price windfall and the rebound in economic activity this year from a low base, we do still see growth and fiscal risks remaining elevated in the medium term. Thank you for listening. Our second speaker will be Dean D'Souza, who will be giving us an update on the MFP Focus model portfolios. Thank you, Emily. Welcome and thank you for joining us in the first feedback session on the recently launched MFP Focus model portfolios. Today, we will be looking back on what has happened in markets and the portfolios over the last quarter, unpacking the drivers of performance to give you a better understanding of what went right and what went wrong in the portfolios. From there, we will look ahead to our views of asset classes over the next 12 months and how this has influenced the way we have positioned the portfolios. Throughout the presentation, please feel free to post your questions in the Q&A. The second quarter saw a continuation of the global growth and corporate profit recovery, driven by ongoing monetary and fiscal stimulus and an acceleration of the vaccine rollout in the developed world. This positive backdrop led to growth asset classes continuing to advance. Local property and local equity markets advanced 12.1% and 0.6% respectively, while global property and global equity delivered RAND returns of 5.8% and 4% respectively, despite a roughly 3.3% strengthening in the RAND, as you can see in the chart. Within global equity, developed markets outperformed emerging markets, evidencing the more effective vaccine rollout, while US markets were further buoyed by the Fed's reiteration of a transitory inflation narrative, which calmed fears of tighter monetary conditions in the near future. 
On the defensive side, despite upside inflation surprises in the US in both May and June, bond markets globally rallied as long bond yields fell sharply. This saw local bonds post very strong returns of 6.9% for the quarter, while global bonds were marginally negative as RAND strength eroded the positive gains from the yield curve flattening. Diving deeper into local equity markets, the second quarter was once again one of contrasting returns from major sectors. With the cyclical recovery in full swing, financials led the charge in the quarter, posting gains of around 8%, while strong gains from domestically exposed industrials were offset by a pullback in NASPERS and process, as the regulatory crackdown in China, which weighed on Tencent's share price, their main underlying asset. Finally, Resources retraced roughly 5% in the quarter as the sector was weighed down by precious metals and the mining subsector. The cyclical recovery narrative was also well evidenced by the performance of the major market cap indices, with mid and small caps, which host many domestically exposed counters, outperforming their large cap peers, which are dominated by the so called rand hedges. Finally, looking at the balance of local asset classes, local property was our best performing asset class, rallying 12% in the quarter, despite its seemingly poor fundamentals. Local bonds also advanced a commendable 7% in the quarter, with longer dated bonds outperforming as we witnessed a yield curve flattening, driven by reduced issuance and renewed interest from foreigners. Finally, Cash returned a measly 1% as real interest rates remained close to zero and the Reserve Bank kept interest rates unchanged at its latest meeting. Turning to the MFP portfolios, this slide shows how the portfolios have performed over their respective time horizons. Now it is important to note that most of the returns history shown is calculated on a back-tested basis and so it is more important to focus on the return profiles you can expect from the different portfolios. As you would expect, the Focus 7 and 7 unconstrained portfolios, as well as their peers, have struggled to achieve their CPI plus 5 benchmarks, and this is primarily driven by the poor returns we've seen from local equity and property over the last 5 to 7 years. While most of the returns history is backtested, the portfolios have however racked up their first quarter of live performance. On an absolute basis, and relative to their respective benchmarks and peers, the portfolios have had a strong start. Before we unpack the main drivers of this performance, it is important to note that this is a very short time period, and as long-term investors, we understand that the investment journey will also have its downs, as this is the nature of investment markets. This table deconstructs the portfolio's returns for the quarter into five main categories. In column A, we show the returns we would expect, assuming we invested passively and for free according to our strategic asset allocations. Given the market drop backdrop, this component is positive for all portfolios, and as we would expect, this is the primary driver of returns. Column B then shows how our tactical asset allocation calls have fared, specifically whether we have over or underweighted the right asset classes. Here results have been a bit more mixed. Column C then shows the aggregate out or underperformance from our underlying managers. We will unpack each of these three in a bit more detail in the later slides. Finally, Column D and E account for the DFM fee and trading effects respectively. Looking closer at our SAA or strategic asset allocation returns, the three asset classes that contributed most across the portfolios are local bonds, local property, and global equity. As you would expect, the contribution from local bonds is much higher in the MFP Focus 3, given its more conservative nature and therefore higher allocation to local bonds. Similarly, as we move up the risk spectrum, the contribution from local property and global property increases. On to our next component, this table gives greater insight into our tactical calls. Overall, our tactical calls marginally detracted from performance in the MFP Focus 3 and 5 portfolios, but contributed marginally in the MFP Focus 7 and 7 unconstrained portfolios, all in the region of around 5 basis points. The primary detractor across the portfolios has been our underweight position in global bonds, and this is driven mainly by the recent RAND weakness in June, while our overweight to global equity and local bonds has contributed. Coming to the final component, this table shows the top three and bottom three contributors to alpha from a manager selection perspective. Given the different weightings in the portfolios, you will notice that the top and bottom contributors may differ from portfolio to portfolio. Starting with our top contributors, Momentum SA Flexible Fixed Interest 
one of our local bond funds, had a spectacular quarter, outperforming bonds by 1.2%. The fund's long duration, its positioning in the longer end of the yield curve, and its marginal allocation to local property were all contributors to its alpha. Our final two biggest contributors are both local equity managers. Fruit Equity's outperformance over the quarter came from the fund having no exposure to precious metal miners, while Alet's value bias benefited from the cyclical recovery theme and the value rotation in markets. On the negative side, Visio Unconstrained Fixed Interest, our second bond manager, underperformed over the quarter, as its more conservative duration position and ILB exposure detracted from performance. The balance of detractors was observed in the equity managers. Globally, the Momentum International Equity Feeder Fund's underweight US allocation and overweight EM allocation detracted from its relative performance, while Coronation Global Emerging Markets' overweight to China meant that it underperformed the EM index. Finally, Fairtree Equity underperformed over the period, owing to its overweight resources position, while Momentum Core Equity, our systematic smart beta fund, marginally underperformed, driven by the underlying trending and quality components, which systematically provide momentum and quality factor exposures, two styles which unfortunately have been out of favor over the quarter. Now looking ahead, we believe markets are poised to continue to benefit from the positive macroeconomic environment expected in the coming 12 months. However, we are cognizant of the potential risks stemming from the spread of the Delta variant, as well as talks of tapering in the US and potentially higher inflation, all of which we expect to introduce volatility into markets. This table shows our portfolio positioning at a mandate level. However, the actual asset allocations of the portfolios may differ slightly as a result of managers' allocations to other asset classes such as cash or global assets. At a mandate level, we have a neutral to overweight position in local bonds and underweight position in global bonds. Global bonds remain extremely expensive, with nominal yields anchored around zero and real yields remaining in negative territory. Given this starting point and the outlook for inflation, there seems to be only one direction they can go from here, up. With the RAND likely range bound around current levels, there is very little support for global bond returns over the next year. Local bonds, on the other hand, offer some of the best real interest rates in the world. Given this attractive starting yield and the steepness of the yield curve, expected returns from this asset class, particularly on a risk-adjusted basis, are very compelling as I'm sure Ian Scott, our head of fixed income, will unpack a bit later. Looking at the equity, both local and global, we are fairly neutral. Within global equity, however, we are overweight EM and underweight DM at a mandate level, given the more attractive valuations in the emerging market space. Given the strong rally in markets to date and the potential risks ahead, we expect some heightened volatility in the coming months. We are therefore relying on our active managers to navigate this volatility, but will look to buy into any sustained broader market weakness, as we expect this to be short-lived given the continued recovery in corporate earnings and global growth. Finally, it is worth touching on our mandate allocation to local property being mostly neutral. Given the negative fundamentals plaguing local property companies, such as rising vacancies and falling rentals, we have a negative outlook on the asset class. However, because we execute via a flexible property mandate, we rely on the manager's skill and speed in navigating the tactical decision between local and global property, with the manager also having the flexibility to hold a significant cash position if they deem it necessary. This brings me to the end of the presentation. Thank you for listening and I hope you found the session insightful. Please feel free to continue posting questions in the Q&A. And also, be on the lookout for further training sessions. We will unpack the mechanics of these portfolios and the underlying constructs in greater deal, detail. Take care and stay safe. Next up is Ian Scott, who will be taking us through our fixed income positioning with a focus on central banks compared to the bond market. Thank you, Emily. Good day, everybody. Today, we're going to talk about this dislocation that we're seeing between the big central banks in the world, so the, the central banks of the governments, and the global bond market. So what has actually happened over the last two years since we've actually had the, the COVID uh, pandemic in the world? Well, I think it's quite important to understand that we've seen unprecedented stimulus in the world, where, as you see in the slide, 
The four major central banks in the world have added more than $27 trillion worth of stimulus into the world. Are we surprised that we are seeing commodity prices run, strong emerging market currencies, very low bond rates in the world? What are we seeing at the moment? The central bankers in the world are actually saying to us, we want economies to do well. We want to support job growth. We want economies to return to where they were prior to 2019. This is why they've done it. What's more important is it's continuing. It's not stopping. And this is the one element of this dislocation where the central banks, especially the Fed and the ECB, are saying, we know inflation is rising, but we want to make sure that the stimulus is actually working. We don't want to just take our foot off the pedal. Mr. Powell saying, look, I'm looking for jobs growth and I'm not seeing it in the U.S. That's why we're going to continue buying the bonds in the U.S. Christine Lagarde of the ECB saying, look, the market can say what it wants, but you can come... To us, we will keep on buying those European and those German bonds. That's one part of this dislocation that we're seeing. If we're then moving on to the next slide, we can see that the market is pricing for hikes in the Fed. This is quite important to understand. So the, the Fed governors are saying, look, we're going to keep on buying bonds. We're going to keep interest rates low at all-time lows. But the market is saying, whoa. We're quite worried about inflation. Think about it. Inflation in the U.S. at this moment is printing 5.4%. We haven't seen inflation like this in the U.S. since the 1970s. Uh, only a few of us were born at that point in time. But it can see over the last 50 years, we've not seen inflation like this in the U.S. And the market is saying, you as the Fed, you actually need to start hiking rates. What is the market pricing? It says, well, interest rates in 2021 will definitely not go up in, in the U.S., in 2022, mm, we think there's a very low probability. 2023, that uh, yellow line on the graph, you can see markets saying the Fed will have no choice but actually to hike rates, and hike rates fairly dramatically from a very low point. Now you can clearly see the Fed governors are talking one thing, and the market is saying, look, you guys need to hike rates, otherwise we're going to have an inflation problem because we don't want to have the what we call that stagflation environment, which we had in the 70s, meaning we've got high inflation and very low growth, the Volcker period. We don't want to have a repeat of that again. So if we move on to the next slide, now this is what we call the dislocation. So what we have here is a thing called the five-year, five-year forward break even. Ooh, long word. What it actually says is, what is the market's expectation for U.S. inflation to be on average over the next five years. So we're probably talking around 2026 now. So what does the market say? Well, the market said about a year ago, when we were in the midst of that COVID pandemic, that inflation in the U.S. over the next five years, so that was out to 2026, we'll probably say, well, we think inflation would have been 1%. Look how that graph has gone up. It's nearly at 2.25% now. Now remember, the U.S. Fed has got a target of average inflation of around 2%. So the market is saying the Fed is behind the curve. It's not going to be able to curb inflation. We've basically seen a more than doubling of inflation expectations of US inflations over the next five years. So you can clearly see the Fed is sitting here saying, look, we're not worried that we're is transitory inflation. And the market is saying, you guys are not going to get it right. Inflation is going to surprise you on the top side. And that's why you've got this, what we call a dislocation. So the markets and the central bank are not talking the same language. Who will be right? We don't know. We will only know in the fullness of time. So unfortunately, we will have to wait until 2026 or 2027 to, to work out what is actually, who is actually right in this time. So if we move on to the next slide, the market is getting worried about this inflation. So it's already said to you, it's looking for two and a quarter percent inflation over the next five years. So what do investors do when they're worried about inflation? They buy inflation protection. So how do you buy inflation protection? You buy inflation-linked bonds, which protect you against the ravages of inflation. Now, in the US, they are called TIPS, Treasury Inflation Protected Securities. But if you look at that graph, you're going to see a very interesting thing. They trade at negative yields. You basically have to pay the Fed to deposit your money. Why would you do it? Well, it says to me two things. Firstly, the market is saying 
to the Fed, you guys are not going to get this inflation story right. We don't believe that inflation in the U.S. is transitory. And it says to us that investors are willing to pay a heavy, heavy premium to get protection on their assets against inflation that's even going to rise more than what we see now. But that's not unexpected because we are always worried as investors around what would happen with inflation, especially if you invest in bonds. Are we surprised by this? Not. Can it even go into deeper negative? Yes, it can, because we've seen a similar situation in Europe. So moving on, what does it actually mean for South African and for emerging market bonds? Now remember, we sit in a space where we call, as South Africa, an emerging market high-yield country, meaning we're at a junk status, and we sit in a very specific peer group. So our peer group is typically Turkey, Brazil, Russia, Mexico, right? But what we see now, we've said to you that we've seen this high inflation, low rates in the US, a big commodity cycle. And what has actually happened, we've seen massive, massive volatility in currencies. Just think about the rand. It's anywhere from 15, 16, and then it goes down to 13, 80. So massive, massive volatility. Look at our peer group. South Africa is probably one of the only EME high yields at the moment that's not hiking interest rates. Brazil, Russia, Turkey, Mexico. They're all hiking rates because they've got very high levels of inflation due to their poor currencies. Notwithstanding the fact that the rand's very volatile, it gets supported by a very strong commodity cycle that we're in at the moment. And we only think, well, the Saab might hike rates probably in the first quarter of, of 2022. But what's quite important to understand here is, remember, bond yields are also very volatile like currencies. But we've not seen that in South Africa. We've actually seen our 10-year bond yield, a green line in the middle, trading very, very sideways. So our 10-year bond yield trades anywhere from, let's say, 9 and a quarter percent down to 8.5 percent, which is very stable in an environment where we've seen Russia, Brazil, Turkey, as I said to you, have all hiked their interest rates. Turkey is all over the show with Mr. Erdogan wanting to run the central bank in Turkey. So... South Africa is actually in a not as bad space as everybody would like out to, to make it to be. So now from a global perspective, that's where we are. So what does it mean then for our South African domestic bonds? So let's have a look at that. This is our South African yield curve, right? So this is what we call the term structure of South African interest rates. Now you can clearly see what we call that front end, right? The, the left side of the, of the curve, right? You can clearly see that it sits at a very low level. It sits probably around 3%. But the long end towards the right sits out to 10.5 or 11%. It says to you there's a big, what we call a term premium in the South African yield curve, meaning a lot of negative news is already priced into the South African curve. So even if the Saab hikes rates uh, next year, we'll think that front end of the curve will only lift a little bit. But that long end will probably go nowhere. Why? Because South African bonds are cheap. We've actually seen... Uh, through all the socio-economic events over the last month or so in South Africa, that our bond yields actually didn't move much. We, you would have thought that when you see riots and upheavals in your country, your bond yields would actually move 4 or 5% or some ridiculous numbers if you go to the history of South Africa. What did we witness about a month ago? Our bond yield probably barely moved. Why? Because South African bond yields are cheap. And we know there's all these negative sentiments in South Africa. Yes, we know about bad ESCOM. Yes, we know about bad transit. But what does it mean at the end of the day? It means it sits in the price. The bond market has already discounted all that bad news. So it will be very hard for the market to go from a cheap level to a very cheap level. Remember, bond markets sell off when yields are low and negative news enters the market. So if the South African bond deal, 10-year bond deal, was sitting at 7% and we had the upheavals in, in Kaiserin and Gauteng, it may have moved to 9%, but now we're already sitting at 9%, so it's already discounting for a, a lot of negative news. And that's why we're so positive on South African bond yields, because we say it's priced for a lot of, lot of negative news at this point in time. Yes, can it go cheaper? Always. It's markets. But over the medium to longer term, and remember bonds are at least a three-year investment, we think we can have very decent nominal and real returns from the South African bond market. What does our inflation-linked bonds look like? So when we move on, a very similar story for what we call our South African inflation-linked bond curve. Remember I showed you the US tips being negative? Now we look at South Africa. Our current curve is the green line that you see in the middle. Quite important to understand, we talked about negative US tips, 
Now, the South African inflation protection probably sits around for all the way from 1.5% all the way out to, call it, 4.5%. So if you're worried about inflation in South Africa, well, you can invest in South African inflation bonds, and you could probably get a return of more than 4% real. So if inflation over the next four years, three, four years in South Africa, is around 4, 4.5%, well, you can make an 8.5% to 9% return out of South African bonds and you get protection against inflation. Well, that's not too shabby to have 4% real returns in South Africa. If you think that historically you could get about 1.5% or 2% real returns. So we like inflation in bonds. We think it's a good place for investors to be when you get high real returns. Once again, this inflation curve is telling you it's pricing for a lot of bad transnet and bad ISKIM and not great government finances. It's already discounted into the curve. So what does it mean at the end of the day when you want to invest into South African fixed income? So let's look at the numbers, right? So I said to you, let's start always with a peg in the ground. Now the peg in the ground is South African inflation. If we look at the Saab and we look at uh, Sanisha's forecast, it says, well, over the next two, three years, inflation is probably going to be around four, four and a half percent. But now if you look at the bottom block, you can see cash in South Africa is probably going to give you 4.5 to 4.75. That means you are not going to make a real return or a return after inflation, especially after fees, by sitting in the South African cash market. But I said to you the curve is very steep. You are getting rewarded for going down that curve to the longer end. Now if you're worried about South Africa, you will say, well, let's see where the credit curve takes you. Well, maybe you can get a 5.5 to 6% return there. That's okay um, if you're very conservative, you won't take a lot of duration risk, but you're also going to get probably, let's say, inflation plus one and a half or inflation plus two. Now, what excites us is the top two blocks where we say, well, there's inflation bonds and there's nominal bonds. And now we're suddenly going to talk around returns of around, call it, seven and a half all the way out to 10% between the two asset classes. What I can't say to you today is, is it going to be better to be in nominal bonds or inflation bonds? We don't know at this point in time because of the volatility in this market. But what we are saying to investors at this point in time is, we think you should have exposure in your portfolio to both these asset classes. Don't try and pick an asset class. Don't think you're going to be smarter than the market and say inflation bonds are going to outperform nominal bonds. I think in the fullness of time, they'll both do well. And we think you should have both in your portfolios especially when you can work out that South African bonds will give you around a 4.5% real return. We think they should be in your portfolios, have exposure to nominals and to ILBs, and I think investors will be well rewarded. Just to put it into perspective, investors who were willing to take this bet over the last year were well rewarded. Nominal and inflation bonds probably returned between 12 and 14%, depending on where you are on the curve. Inflation was 3.5%. Not many years when you get nearly inflation plus 11% from the South African fixed income markets. Yes, it may not be returned again. We know that the past won't repeat itself. But if you can get inflation plus 4.5 to 5% from South African bonds, we think it should be in your portfolios. Thank you. Our last speakers will be Yaku de Jager and Ronnie Bornman, who will be giving us an update on Momentum Focus Fund of Funds. Thank you, Emily. Good day, and welcome to the quarterly update for the Momentum Focus Fund of Funds. I am Jakke de Jager, and I'm joined today by my colleague and co-portfolio manager, Ronnie Bornman, to give you a bit of a sense for how the portfolios have performed of late, our portfolio delivery, as well as our positioning. It is incredible to think that we are nearly 18 months down the line from the point at which markets first capitulated under the strain of COVID, the uncertainty attached to economic growth, and the impact the market expected it to have on company earnings and viability. While global markets have experienced a strong recovery post the COVID-induced sell-off in 2020, it remains fair to say that multi-asset class funds, especially those with a more aggressive investment target or performance goal, continue to struggle measured relative to higher CPI-linked objectives. Unlike the early to mid-2000s, as well as the early teens, a view of a five-year rolling returns across the three major CISA categories confirms that investors were not rewarded for additional risk, as the average fund in the high, medium, and low equity categories generally performed in line with each other. The sharp recovery in local and global risk assets during the second half of 2020 
assisted multi-asset class portfolios in again delivering real returns, although the magnitude of real returns continues to disappoint, averaging little more than 1% above inflation. While investors are understandably concerned at the lack of returns, we are not in unfamiliar territory, referring to the period spanning 2011 and 2012. We remain cautious on the ability of risk assets to attain the performance levels that followed that particular period, this time around, as the world is seemingly moving into a lower yielding environment. A view of the historic performance delivery of the Momentum Focus Fund of Funds confirms the funds' ability to deliver inflation-beating returns over appropriate investment terms. As the chart illustrates, performance is unfortunately not generated in a straight line, and we, as humans, often question our ability to stay the course and trust the process, in this case, the investment philosophy. We have emerged from and are continuing to excel in this unique post-COVID environment. In what has been a very difficult performance cycle for our multi-asset class funds, we have used the investment opportunities presented to evolve our thinking and strengthen our decision making, and we are starting to see the results thereof in the strong recoveries in each of the funds. While hard work remains ahead, we are at the same time also pleased to say that we've been able to deliver a peer relative outcome over the duration of these funds. At the end of the day, our funds remain well positioned and we are true to the OBI philosophy and long-term delivery remains credible. Ronnie, turning our attention to you, please really give us a sense for how the portfolios we have been positioned during this time. What decisions did we make? Did we implement strategies? Thank you, Aki, uh, and welcome to everybody dialing in today. You know, achieving real return targets over the medium and longer term remains challenging in the current environment. And asset class non-delivery has seen market-linked portfolios across the spectrum fall short of CPI-linked objectives. The recent market recovery has lessened the pain and the funds are performing well. Measured since the market bottom in March 2020, we've witnessed strong returns across the focus fund of fund range, irrespective of the risk profile. Focusing on the Focus 3, 5, and 7 fund of funds, we've seen these funds outperform their respective peer group funds by between 5 and 8% over the past 18 months, driven in part by our decision to overweight domestic and offshore equities based on the recovery in economic growth and improvements in, in company earnings, as well as selective opportunities that presented themselves back in quarter one of 2020, when domestic bond yields rose sharply. Aligned to the strong showing in nominal bonds, we also maintained a healthy allocation to inflation-linked bonds throughout the cycle. Our portfolios are performing ahead of our strategic asset allocation benchmarks. The short and medium-term numbers have improved significantly on a peer relative perspective, following a difficult quarter one in 2020. Drivers of short-term performance include the ongoing alpha delivery from our domestic equity solution. Changes were made during the latter part of 2019 and early 2020, where both Perpetua and Ford were removed from the lineup and partially replaced by 91 asset management. So too, have we seen a strong recovery from our offshore equity component, whether value style or risk premium, coupled with periods of relative underperformance from some of the global mega cap shares, led to a strong outperformance over the MSCI World Index. Medium term performance for this component is still below benchmark, but we are confident that some of the positioning and management actions of our colleagues in London will contribute strongly on an aggregate level. The flexible fixed interest fund, managed by Coronation and Prescient, has also seen a strong reversal in performance. The fund was especially hard hit in early in 2020, as it was positioned towards the longer part of the yield curve, and as yields blew out, suffering market-to-market market market losses. As yields subsequently moved lower, the lost value of these positions also recovered. Measured against our strategic asset allocation, portfolio performance over the past 12 months has been driven by both our asset allocation decisions as well as strong strategy or share selection across the respective building blocks in each fund. The asset allocation impact was the stronger contributor over the 12 months, as captured in the orange bars, where share and mandate selection, represented by the pink bars, also contributed. As mentioned, strong alpha in both the local and global equity components were strong contributors on a building block level, whereas our tactical positioning related to especially local property and domestic bonds also added to performance. A quick look at the domestic equity building block confirms the strong outperformance generated over the past number of years, where the sum of the equity mandates managed to outperform both its cap fixed 
Equity Benchmark, as well as the CISA General Equity Peer Group. A diversified exposure to a range of investment strategies and styles continue to benefit the equity components, and on aggregate, would have easily ranked in the top quartile of the peer group. We are therefore very happy with the way things have progressed over the past 18 months or so, Yaki. But as you mentioned earlier, changing market dynamics and circumstances, especially as we emerge from the COVID pandemic, remains key to our future success. Would you perhaps elaborate on the portfolio positioning? Absolutely. Thank you, Ronnie. The following slide is a graphical representation of how the focus fund of funds are positioned relative to their respective CSA peer groups. Based on previous experience and aligned to specific objectives, we have from time to time observed the funds being positioned slightly differently than parts of the market and other peer groups. That often has also led to different performance outcomes. As at the end of June, however, you will notice that there is a smaller divergence in asset allocations across the range with perhaps the exception being the Momentum Focus 3 fund of fund that is positioned more on the conservative end of the spectrum. Looking at portfolio positioning from a local perspective, and as you men mentioned, Ronnie, the local equity allocation remains our largest overweight across our funds. Although we have been reducing the size of the overweight of late, we still see a lot of value from the growth asset classes. We continue to have a more cautious out outlook in terms of the local listed property sector, where our funds are generally positioned to maintain a neutral to underweight exposure to this specific asset class. We have also commenced a slow rotation from inflation-linked bonds to nominal bonds, given the strong returns we've experienced. As with local equities, we are positioned with an overweight exposure to global equities, and therefore also an underweight to global bonds. And staying with the global theme, we have also closed our underweight position relative to global property. I trust that today's overview has been both informative and interesting, and we thank you for your time. Thanks, Yaku. Until next time, take care and stay safe. Goodbye. Today was a really interesting session. Here are a few of my key take-home points. Sanisha mentioned that the COVID-19 pandemic has triggered the worst global recession experienced in post-war history, and we have seen the fastest paced economic recovery. The sharp recovery in local and global risk asset classes assisted multi-asset class funds in delivering real returns. While in the short term, the recent unrest that we experienced is likely to drive a negative third quarter for 2021, multi-asset class solutions are market-linked investments because these investment vehicles derive from or are based on an underlying market measure. It is therefore important to note that short-term volatility is not an indicator of long-term trend, and it's also very crucial to remain invested by sticking to your investment methodology and the investment time horizon. And finally, fixed income is still here to stay. Ian mentioned that it is important not to try and pick the best curve, but have exposure to both yield curves. Based on valuations, our local bonds and inflation-linked bonds are the most attractive asset classes with decent nominal and real return expected. Thank you once again for joining us and we hope this will give you a meaningful discussion opportunities with your clients. Our next event will be MFP Outcome Matters and normal viewing will resume. We look forward to engaging with you throughout the year. Don't forget to view our new website under Investments and Savings, which has a meaningful new fund pages, obtain fund fact sheets, and just to catch up with what the investment business has been up to. Finally, you have dedicated support with Rupert, Kirtley, and I around the country. So feel free to get in touch. Take care and stay safe and healthy, our MFP partners.